Our flag means death, sniper elite the board game, and rebuilding Seattle. This is staying in. Uh, I just want to, um, it's very important, obviously, when we meet, you have to ensure that you've got the minimum player count to ensure the meeting can go ahead. Yes. So, Sam? Yes. Pete? No, last I last I saw of Pete, he was throwing an axe into a wall. And turning in a manner that <laughs> is not smug, but clearly is smug. A, a sanctioned axe throwing. Oh yes, very, very good point. Not like some extreme DIY. <laughs> no, so he's he's throwing axes literally as we record now. Well, yes. maybe not literally as we record now, because it was a, quite a while ago he sent that video. Yeah, but I like to think that he's just carried on. For two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but axe throwing. Um, so yeah, so put a peg in that, because we need to talk about that. Yeah, but okay, Dan? Okay, no, Dan either. All right. No, I don't think he's throwing axes. No. He might just be a bit under the weather. Well, it's just you and I then. It's just the tuna bus. So I think we're just core it, I think. I think one is too far. We can't do a podcast with one person, can you? We've never tried. No, we've never tried. And I don't think we will try. I mean, people do. Yeah, people do do that. You're absolutely right. I think maybe the last ever podcast would be just one person like a tontine like everyone's yeah. died yeah <laughs> and it's just one and they're just there to lock up and they're just there to lock up and it's just one final yeah. show uh and that and that'll be it yeah just the sound of the last post just the lone bugle uh, it's nice to know you know it's nice to know it'll be in safe hands when, yes when we've passed do you do you know of the um do you know of the Death Till Us Blart? Death Till Death Do Us Blart podcast? I don't. Has this got anything to do with Paul Blart Morecup? It certainly does. So, um, you will be aware of the Worst Idea of All Time podcast. Oh, it's a fantastic podcast. Yeah. So, it's uh, Guy Montgomery and Tim Bat. And they basically they, they invented a podcast called The Worst Idea of All Time, where I think it started off out as they watched sex in the city 2 i think uh, like every week for a whole year and then every episode was them talking about the <laughs> the movie over that period of time i think their latest idea if i'm right is that they're going to watch fast and the furious 10 10 times fast and the furious 9 9 times fast and the furious 8 8 times and go all the way down the series until they finish just watching the first Fast and the Furious film once which I think is an ingenious idea I, I sent you a link the other day um, because there was an article I think it was in the Guardian about a film academic who watched Groundhog Day every day for a year <laughs> and chronicled their um, yeah. experience of that starting off a little bit like Guy Montgomery and Tim Batts where to start off with, it's the broad brushstrokes of understanding what the film's about. But after, when you get to like the last month, they were talking about how they were creating like these meta narratives in their heads between the background characters. Yes. And, you know, these kinds of lack of, you know, these continuity errors actually justifying them as kind of being narratively, you know, canon, I suppose, really. Yeah. Well, what, well, what, Till Death Do Us Blart is is a it, they describe it as an eternal podcast, and they do this with the three McElroy brothers, and every Thanksgiving they all watch Paul Blart More Cop Two specifically number two, and then they they talk about it. And the idea is is at the end of the show they all nominate who they want to take over for them should they die in between the recordings, and it would just. It, th- they just want this thing to keep going and going and going for all eternity. Right. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's le- let's lift this. Oh, oh. Um, but, but talking of Dan, he was well enough a few days ago to come and visit me in the north for a weekend. Brilliant. And we had a blast, Chris. When you say you had a blast, what did you do? We, um, what did we do? What did we do? We played a lot of FIFA football on the PlayStation 5. We won the Champions League. 
Well done. Thank you very much. Um, we went to a place in Manchester called Almost Famous, which if you live in a, a sort of around this sort of area, is quite well known. It's the kind of place, Chris, where I could describe the food it offers and I could give you an idea of the cuisine, but it would just be quicker for me to say on every single table is a roll of kitchen roll rather than serviettes. Right. So I mean that that says a lot, doesn't it? It does say a lot. It does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> say no more. Full stop. Let's draw a line under that. So what else did you and Dan do? Uh and then we went to another we went to another place called Pixel Bar. And so Pixel I don't know if they've got any other if anywhere anywhere else does it. I'm sure they do, I'm sure they do. It it seems like quite a no brainer um and on every table idea. Um so what you do is you pay some money to rent a booth and at every booth there's a specific games console. So when you book... Oh, a games say, console. Okay. Yeah. What you say, uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to be there for a couple of hours and I'd like a PS5, please, or I'd like an Xbox or a Switch. There's also like a, a, a PC gaming bay downstairs as well. Um, uh, if you want to, you know, do your Apexes or Fortnites or whatever. But we, um, I hired us a, a PS5 for a couple of hours. And it's, you know, in terms of like business savvy ideas, like it's pretty, because you got your initial overheads in terms of buying all the consoles and stuff like that. But then you're basically charging people to just sit down for a couple of hours and then use their bar facilities and just play, play games. And... Um, so we had the PlayStation 5, which came with PlayStation Plus Premium, which, you know, is the one that comes with all, like, the, the game's catalogue and stuff like that. And they got a super quick in- internet. So while we were playing other games it had installed, we were, like, downloading other things that we really wanted to to try out um, as we were playing. Um, and we played... Uh, have you ever played a game called Ultimate Chicken Horse? I think we both know the answer to this. <laughs> no, um, it's it's. I part of me doesn't really want to say much about it because the joy. Well, of the, the, game the name is, creates itself, doesn't it? Really. <clears throat> well, the name creates itself, and most of the joy of the game is it slowly dawning on you what the game actually is. So, if you don't want to know much about it, you can skip ahead a couple of minutes. But for the sake of entertaining Chris, I, I might as well go into it. So Ultimate Chicken Horse is you each take the role of a woodland creature, let's say. And you have these levels. Um, it's a bit like Heave Ho in the way that you've oh, got yes. these levels where all you're trying to do is go from the start to the goal. That's all you're trying to do. And um, most of the levels... Um, like in Heave Ho, are sparsely populated. So you've got like a platform that you're standing on for the start and there's no clear way of how you're going to get to the to the goal. So before each round starts, it opens up this thing called the party box. And from that, you're able to pick things like stairwells and um, wooden beams and blocks and barrels. And each player independently puts those things into position and then you can use those things to then get to your goal however here's a twist that's pretty much what the game's like for the first couple of rounds and then after that inside the party box it starts to include things like a swinging bell pendulum barbed wire flamethrowers um a a black hole that sucks you into oblivion and it's then and you've got you've got to place all of these and then you've got then you've got to place all of these so essentially you're sabotaging the run for everyone else in the attempts that you are trying to um make it to the goal as well so it's this wonderful like balance of everyone trying to sabotage themselves but yet everyone also trying to make sure that there's a clean route to the goal it reminds me of that oh uh, to a degree, sorry, this is a board game equivalent. What was that? Is it Welcome to the Dungeon or Into the Dungeon or something? What's it called? Yeah, Welcome to the Dungeon, yeah. Where you are putting together the deck 
or you're, you're you're looking at i'm trying to remember how the game works but basically it's a bit of push your luck yes you can you can kind of stack the deck hopefully in your favor but you can also sabotage it for the rest of the players around the table but there has to be you're looking kind of for an optimum route into that dungeon if memory serves me correct yeah it's it's well, that was hilarious yeah it's it's really good fun um and it's usually on on sale and next time it's on sale on my switch i'm going to pick it up for for a next party I, I think it's going to join that sort of group of games like um towerfall heave ho uh, overcooked the other game that we really um enjoyed was a game called move or die don't know if you ever heard of this one no so move or die is in the same uh, in the same sort of wheelhouse as like heave ho or ultimate chicken horse it's basically like a multiplayer party game the conceit of the game is if you're not moving your health bar depletes so if you just sit there doing nothing then you die hence the name move or die but what happens is is that each round that you play of the game is like a different like sort of theme or genre of game that you get to pick beforehand so it could be that you pick like a game that's almost like Splatoon where you've got to cover the most area of the the screen and paint or there's one where you've just got to avoid these falling blocks there's another where you're each holding all these chainsaws but the only way you can kill each other is by chainsawing someone from from the back like backstabbing them and there's another one where every time you press square you just let this like little robot go along the ground and it explodes if it touches another another player so it's like full of all these like almost like a collection of party mini games which sort of randomize every time you go into a round but the fact is because you've always got to keep on moving there's never really much time for you to sit there and like assess situations and be like right what am i going to do here how am i going to puzzle this out you've just got to keep on on moving and to add like um spice to the szechuan it's what, what it also has is has these things called mutators. And mutators essentially like bend the rules of each minigame in unique ways. So it could be things like you can now double jump or you have a jetpack. Or it can be really crazy things like the only way you can move is by pressing X. And depending on where this arrow is moving above your head, you then jump into the direction of where that arrow was pointing or every time you press x you gravity switches for you and you move to the ceiling or back to the floor depending on oh my god and the best one and the best one chris was a one called it was called like a a, a a randomizer or a cryptographer or something like that and literally it just jumbled everything like we didn't even know what game we were joining up next we didn't know who was winning it just literally just comes up with the fact that you're playing a new round, comes back down, and then everyone's just like got to try and work out what game that we're playing playing next. It was it was really good fun, really great fun. Was there anyone there playing games that aren't that ilk that are kind of like heavy, like they're in it for the day? It was like it was weird as we were browsing through the PlayStation Plus Premium Store and just thinking, "Oh, does anyone else mind if I just do the first twenty minutes of The Last of Us?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, read the room, man. And going to somewhere like Pixel Bar was absolutely that. Like we were sitting there playing our game, laughing and and joking and sort of shouting each other. And then the table next to us were all shouting and laughing and joking because of the game that they were playing. And the table over the, the other side of the room was also laughing and joking and being like it was just it was that was just like the great thing about video games, you know, that all these people yeah. were having this shared the shared and lovely experience that sounds great and then we watched eager in the evening oh i was so jealous <laughs> i cannot wait to watch this so for new listeners we as a pod i think it's fair to say all of us actually even pete yes um, that's why he's axe frying he just he got a real buzz we've become like a, a lot of the western world now nah, we've just discovered this fantastic director and this fantastic genre of cinema that's been around for ages but sadly the west is just as usual late to the party ss rajamuli yeah. and this is one of his early films from like the early 2000s isn't it sam 
no, 2012. 2012, mm. sorry. Uh, it's, it's about 10 years old, so a bonkers premise. Mm-hmm. Bonkers premise. So the premise is... <laughs> <laughs> the premise is there's this um, man named Nani, and he's um, he's fallen in love with uh, his neighbour called Bindu. And she runs this charity, and this guy suddenly approaches this charity called um, Sudeep, and he also falls in love with Bindu and tries to woo Bindu, but Bindu's not falling for any of it. And Bindu's decided that she wants to be with with Nani. So Sudeep gets really angry and kills Nani. Then Nani um, reincarnates as a fly and... This fly remembers who killed him and that he was in love with Bindu. So the fly enacts um, mortal mortal vengeance on Sudeep and vows to kill him. Now, you might be thinking, this listener, this is a very funny but light and frothy kind of film. No, mm. this film's two hours long. I mean, that's like the Count of Monte Cristo. I mean, it is quite light and frothy. It is, it is described as a comedy, yeah. an action comedy. And it is a lot lighter and frothier than RRR. Um, there's still, like, you know, song and dance numbers. There's still tremendously over-the-top um, action scenes. Not just action scenes, just general going about doing day-to-day things is largely over-the-top. And It does not waste a single shot. It does not waste a single shot, a single minute, a single breath, really. There, there was a ne- there was a big buzz, pun intended, nice about m- about Man versus B last year. This is the film that Man versus B wanted to be, like seeing one man being terrorized by a fly and being driven slowly insane by the presence of a fly is. In this film, utterly hilarious, engrossing, and an absolute joy to watch. Mainly because he deserves it, because he's the bad guy, and you're rooting for <laughs> for the fly yeah. in all of this. And that's that's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah, it is on Amazon Prime. And in terms of the two films I've watched this year, Eager and Barbarian, being probably two of the most bonkers films I've I've seen in my ent- <laughs> in my entire life. Can't wait for that. So yeah, so it was a pleasant weekend. Wow, much fun was had by all. But you mentioned Sam. We watched Barbarian, which again, it's like it's like a few of the films we've discussed on the pod, where just a bit like Glass Onion. We don't really want to talk about it. We just want to let people no. see it because because a lot of people have said that they felt the film was overhyped. I went in not knowing anything about it other than you need to watch it with somebody. So I don't know whether that's good or bad. Uh, I think a lot of people had it ruined for them, A, because they've seen trailers or they've read up about it, and B, or B, it's just been overhyped for them. Just just watch it. The thing that made me laugh the entire time watching it, and I kept turning to you at instances, was because <laughs> as mad as the stuff that we were watching, I knew that Dan's experience of reading the synopsis to the film on Wikipedia would, even, would be madder <laughs> would still. Be, yeah, it would be madder. Yeah, uh, 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 absolutely. I... I, there, I the, the the day after I got home, I recounted the whole plot to my wife, and seeing her face, like just slowly, like eyes agape, mouth open, as the story went on and on and on, like trying to, and like and and like talking about it out loud to someone. That plot was just another surreal and bonkers experience. What a film! Like that, like in terms of, you know. I'm I'm sure if I critically analysed it, I could find some fault, faults in it. But in terms of something that stayed with me, and like I've thought about often since, um, not many films like it. No, like the plot is very simple, but the way it is filmed, yes, is just great. Like uh, for me, the actual image I remember the most is the moment where there was a shot. And then you and I just turned and looked at each other and I could see we were both horrified and humoured in equal measure. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I love about modern horror. Yeah. Cool. 
Chris, let's talk about some of the board games that me and you've been playing. Recently. Oh yeah, because it wasn't you didn't just hang out with Dan. You hung out with me. You came round to mine. I did hang out with you. I'm a proper social butterfly, me. I know. Um, we played a good many things. I think I lost all of them. <laughs> you did. I I, I, ne- I nearly I, I nearly sent you a message to apologise actually because I am 37 years old. But mm. I am, I've realised I'm a very bad loser and I'm happy to admit this to you <laughs> and the listener. I just realised that I try and confront that. I have this kind of nice guy persona, I'm pretty chilled. But I will take against a game immediately if I lose it. You and I need, to, I need to check that. I need to check that. You know, it's mm. not good because every time I lose a game, there's an awkward moment where I can tell you wanting to ask me, so what do you think of the, what do you think of the game? And you're just annoyed about it. It's like, oh, well, um, yeah, um, well, I think it's just a bit too, you're a bit too overpowered and I just don't think it's balanced <laughs> enough, Sam. And then what happens is you go and I'm at night thinking, actually, that's a bloody good game. But, oh, shit. Um, we'll never play it again because... I've, <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I, well, because uh, I, I, I bad mouthed it in front of Sam, and uh, yeah, actually, it's a really good game, and actually, every single game we played, Sam, was really, really good. It was. And um, let's start. Let's start with rebuilding Seattle. Okay. Yeah. Because I was expecting not to like this at all. Because I looked at it on the table, I thought, oh, okay, this looks like a. It looks a bit like some kind of weird Euro Amerifresh kind of combo, really. But it's more yeah. than that at all. That's rendering a disservice, actually. There's some really lovely little kind of... Um, well, it, it puts you in a very interesting situation, really, in where you're kind of... You're forced to make a kind of a, a really interesting choice, really, pushing your luck with regards to victory points or with regards to working with your own player board, really, which isn't something overly new. Uh, but... Um, in this particular context, in what is actually a very tight game, it licks it on long at quite a fast pace. It's only yeah. three rounds. I found that really lovely. It, it scratched lots of itches that I get with, say, bigger, bulkier games like Brass, for example. But it did it in a much, much reduced time. Yeah, that was that was a thing that really struck me about it. Is and and I think it's something that more and more board games are doing. Like I played Brian Baru the other day with five people. Oh. With and, five? What was that like with five? Oh, it's incredible. It's so good. Really? But the thing about that game is, Chris, is that because it's got that inbuilt timer into it, once you've got, once you've married off everyone who's going to get married off in that game, that it it ends. So there's such a stream, there's such a pace to it already that even with five people, it still feels like it really licks along, it still feels like it has this pace to it. Especially when, it, you know, the trick-taking game, it's quite it's quite easy for you to assess what you want to do and where you kind of envisage yourself being each round. Like Brian Baru, in terms of design, is just very, very clean. It's it's immaculate. It really is, yeah. It, it, it It's a great game. Um, so with five people, it kind of licked along, but... Yeah, rebuilding Seattle kind of made me think about Brian Brew in that same way. In that, it's got a very strict time limit, a very strict uh, round structure to it. So how the game works is it's eighteen eighty nine, and um, the Great Fire of Seattle has burned down most of the downtown. So each player, and this plays from one to five, so there is a solo mode. Uh, basically becomes like the contractor or the person responsible for a certain area of downtown Seattle. So you were one part, I was another part, um, which is already quite unique because each um, part that you're sort of organising and working with it in, in is unique. They have their own different laws and their own different guidance of things that they can do in that area so everyone's already coming at this this problem this puzzle in a um in a different way and what you're trying to do is basically make the most desirable part of um of the city by making sure that you've got um nice restaurants to eat at some lovely entertainment but also making sure that You've got universities and you've got um, colleges 
and you've got um, finance sectors. And but but then on top of that, making sure that, you know, your population isn't getting too overbearing and your population is well served by all these amenities that you're building in. And then on top of that sort of puzzle of balancing that, you're also completing this tetronomo tile laying puzzle of purchasing all these restaurants and purchasing all these cinemas and universities and laying them on this grid and there are certain you know adjacency bonuses and certain cards which allow you to um, make the most and take advantage of certain amount of things that you're able to squeeze into this very small downtown area and it's all kind of systems within systems but again it kind of seems to manage to do it in a really streamlined way that even the two of us and I think it probably took us about an hour and a half to get through the game it still felt like it was really zipping along like I don't feel like there was any point where I didn't know what I wanted to do next like I didn't have any clear direction I felt like I was sort of in control of what I wanted to do and where I was going throughout most of the throughout most of the game which is one hell of an achievement I think for a game that looks as big and as imposing as rebuilding Seattle does yes I think there was an, a moment earlier on where I, I, I suddenly got to the point where I had invested in a big property a big kind of tetronomo piece early on and i found myself um needing some cash and you've got these you i don't know what you call them they're these tiles in the center these six tiles that can only be activated once per round and there's three rounds yeah the event tile, the event cards the event tiles and, and quite often they'll some of them will give you cash but the issue is the round ends when all six of those event tiles are flipped so again, there's that really interesting choice between, well, okay, for, that'd be great now if I were, really want to buy this property now because I activate this event. But actually, do I really want to do that now? Because if I do that now, actually, I won't get the benefit of that particular event because I'm not in a position yet where I can get the most out of it. And also, I'm ending the round quicker than it could. I'll let Sam actually do that and end the round. And But towards the end of the game, because, you know, as I mentioned beforehand, I didn't do very well. I, it almost became this wonderful passive aggressive thing I would do to you, where I was thinking, "Oh, he's having way too much fun at this." Yeah, close it down. And I don't, I don't want him running away with this. I'm just going to end this game. I'm just going to, I'm just going to end this game, and I'll get a little bit of a perk. But really, I just want to end this game for him. <laughs> so that was that. That was really nice for me personally to have that. I'd be quite curious to know what that's like with a bigger player cat. Yeah, I'd be quite curious to know. Um, how that works i mean the size of the table is going to have to be something because yes you were only playing it the two of us and it took up the whole of your extendable dining room table it did indeed yeah because you've got the you've got the board in front of you which represents the town then you've got the board where you're putting all your uh, tetronomo pieces and laying these tiles down which expands and grows and starts swallowing up more of the table then you've got this huge um, other board, which is where you track um, scores, where you put cards, where you have the market, where all these pieces are are being sold and put up for auction, and then and then you've got all the the actual bits of plastic, all the actual bits of cardboard and tiles and the bobbins and the and the money and everything that you need to actually sort of bring the game to life. So, you know, I've I, I've thought about introducing this. For more players but i genuinely don't know if, who's got a table big enough to 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 put it on i think what i'm more sort of concerned about in the game actually is that timer because even though i think it is a brilliant piece of design and really gets you to, to focus and hone in on it i think it could for some people cast a really bad first impression because you mentioned it when when we were playing, like there's games like Brass, um, or you know even something like uh, another Martin Wallace game like Tinner's Trail or Anno eighteen hundred, 
where the breadth of the game is so large and there's really no strict inbuilt timer to it that you can slowly feel your way through the game and early mistakes can be easily rectified and um, overridden because you've got sort of space to really delve into it and learn about it. However, with rebuilding Seattle, unless you've really thought about what you want to do in subsequent rounds, the game the game's over. Like, it's just done. And you could end up getting to the third round and being like, I've only just really learned... <laughs> yeah what 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 the game is like what what i want to do yeah um, and and that w- and this isn't to kind of like you know defend you know it's not for me to find an excuse here but t- typically when i play games like this i have a longer time to build my engine and get my game plan yeah. in place mm-hmm. um oh, yeah. like games like brass like if brass ended that that soon there's no chance i would kind of come close to winning i mean that's you know that's that's up to me obviously to scale up how i play to the duration of the game but um it is quite disarming that definitely i think also for me was and this is obviously subjective is the fact that you're rebuilding seattle aside from like Mm. the the silhouette of a particular a skyline of that part of seattle aside from the classic tetronomo thing i didn't really feel like i was building a city didn't feel like a city builder really to a degree because it's kind of largely abstract you've got a you know it's a star and a cube isn't it really the kind of the boxes you kind of work with victory points and kind of ranking up those aforementioned things you say such as the entertainment the restaurants this sort of thing really Mm. i mean we had some lovely seattle grunge music playing in the background but like i i don't know like i i struggled to immerse myself and it felt quite abstract and for me yeah, well, I, well, I think it is maybe it is just one of these games that is more of an as- abstract prospect, and it's been um, the th- the theme has been sort of um, loosely applied somewhat in this regard, and I feel like it could be it could be a bit stronger in places. You know, when you're considering rebuilding a city, but yeah, it's got to happen really super quick. And we and within sort of three rounds, and there's no thematic justification for for that to happen. Again, it, it's just one of those things that can leave a bit of a, you know, bitter taste in one's mouth. But that puzzle, man, that yeah, that that constant juggling of right, I've got to make sure I have enough restaurants, but I've also got to make sure that the quality of the restaurants is pretty high, and I've also got to ensure that my population isn't getting too much but also making sure that i'm buying the right buildings i'm picking up the right cards i'm doing all this in a timely fashion really watching what your opponent is doing to try and guess when they're going to try and pop off these event cards in the middle because as you were saying like it gets you it gets to a point where I was like holding off and holding off and holding off to try and make sure when I reach these event cards that I get the best turn out of it. But also I was trying to preempt you doing it and trying to make sure I was doing it in a timely way that stopped you getting the most benefit from it. And I love that kind of stuff. Like that, that tension, that push and pull of trying to read the room and, do something and it's it's a bit like it's like no thanks isn't it like no thanks is just that perfect like encapsulation of that feeling where you're trying to do something and trying to preempt the room but also trying to push it just that little bit further in the hopes that like all of your <laughs> all of your dreams all of your numbers numbers come to fruition it's um yeah rebuilding seattle is is certainly um really interesting and um worth a look if like city builders and um balancing tracks in yes. board games is your is your <laughs> is your, is your deal and i feel like it might be one of those things where it's worth trying in a like a board game cafe first because of that tight three round structure and then going right i get it now and then playing again and playing again and really trying to maximize the most out of those of those rounds
So I lost, I didn't rebuild Seattle well enough, apparently. I lost no. that. Did your best. But I was thinking, oh, it's okay. Don't worry, because actually that's just a start. The main course is going to be Sniper Elite, the board game. Mm, mm, mm. This is from Rebellion Unplugged. Yeah, we've been after this for a while. I know. Um, and Just uh, a slight, um, slight disclosure. We know and are friends with someone who works at Rebellion Unplugged. Um, so take what we say with a pinch of salt, but um, it's a bloody good game. <laughs> it is a bloody good game. I was, and, and that's what irritated me more when I lost because I, I, yeah. what I felt was I wasted a good game here mm. uh, because I misread a rule and it cost me. So this is a hidden movement game. So for new listeners... We've, we've spoken about lots of hidden movement games in the past. It's a genre that both you and I really like, Sam. You know, we talked about Fury yeah. of Dracula, Less from White Chapel, Less from White Chapel. Uh, this is of that sort of ilk, really. Oh, and Escape from the Aliens of Outer Space as well, where based on a very popular video game series from Rebellion, which we've also played, Sam, um, co-op. Yep. Um, one of you is a sniper in World War Two, and is having to complete missions and what that looks like is a map and it's a two-sided board and you are given a deck of cards and it is like a deck of cards which is a really cool aesthetic you pick two at random and they the numbers on those respective cards tell you the locations you've got to get to and then announce that you've done the objective at that location and then get out love it wonderful i, I just ah oh. Just just from bottom to top, the design and the love that's gone into oh, this. It's a lot of love. Um, game is incredible. Like just those objective cards. I mean, that could have just been, you know, a piece of card with the box uh, on the back and that would have been it. But no, yeah. it's a set of playing cards. that looks like it's been sort of hidden inside the inside pocket of a leather jacket of a spy yeah. who's you know, made it all the way over to Germany. It's like passing on some like little details. And I mean, I'm probably looking too much into it, but even, but just, just, just that was immediately my imagination was, was sparked into, you, you could just see like the playing card and then the, the sniper, like holding it over a kettle and peeling it back. Oh yeah. Peeling back the, the layer of the club or the diamond to see what the the objective was underneath like oh it's so good yeah that's it and talking about clocks we've spoken about clocks in rebuilding seattle this also has a game clock sound because what i can't do as a sniper is dilly dally because i only have 10 moves per objective so it's what's great about this game is i only have 20 moves sam knows i only have 20 moves so it's not as if i can just literally run around the map just um kind of causing distractions left right and center i have to ensure that i am at my first objective within 10 moves and that's where the interesting rub occurs really and for the first few moves or so oh i was loving it i snuck around yeah. a corner just as sam swept by and he just missed me i was in the space next to him <laughs> and then i found my objective and and didn't realize i could just do nothing on a go i thought i had to then suddenly i'm here now I have to announce where I am. And unfortunately, it was in a bottleneck and I was just hemmed in. Because even though Sam's character is not allowed to... You're not allowed to attack me unless you're in the same space as me. Because I'd played a card face down, Sam had a pretty good idea that I had got a mine there. So Sam knew that if he went into that space, he'd blow up. So we had this really interesting kind of stalemate where it was it was essentially waiting for me to dial down, you know, work through my clock, really. And unfortunately, I was shot twice in the end. And it, then it became almost like a game of chess, didn't it, really? Because I wasn't playing yeah. it properly because I was playing it how I usually play a sniper game. where I, Sneaky, sneaky. I'm very, very sneaky, sneaky. Whereas actually the way this game works it has this wonderful mechanic where if you imagine, listener, I'm two spaces away from Sam. I want to shoot him. I have a little bag and inside it are these little tokens. Uh, there's tokens for successful shots a token for suppression a token for a noise i've made a noise and if i draw two of those sam knows where i am 
And I think there's another one which is kind of like a miss or something. Apologies. Yeah, like a misfire, yeah. Yeah. Now, the way you calculate how many tokens you draw is you calculate how many spaces are between you and your opponent. So I'm two away from Sam. So realistically, I only need to draw two. However, if I draw two and it's a, a successful hit, um, Sam knows that I am either in the space next to him or two away. And all I've done then is actually reveal I'm actually in a radius of two from him. Um, it's not as bad as drawing two noise tokens and then he knows exactly where I am, but he knows roughly where I am. And that's not the way this game works. What the best tactic is, is to try and draw more tokens than you need. Because if I get a success with a sizable amount of hit tokens, Sam can't be fully sure where I am. I could be right next to him, but I could equally be quite far away. Now, obviously, this is why this game is genius. The further you are away, as in life, with taking a sniper shot, I mean, I can't expe- speak for it. Pete's probably on that now, as we were recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's finished with his axes. Is that if um, this is where you push your luck? Because, yes, I, if, I, if it's successful, great. He doesn't know where I am. Where did that shot come from? But if I, for whatever reason, by chance, I don't pull the right amount of shoot tokens, but I pull noise tokens, then I'm stuffed. Uh, because actually I've pushed my luck too far and that bullet I fired, I I forgot to put the suppressor on my rifle or it pinged off something and made a sound and Sam knows exactly where I am. And that's wonderful. You You don't really feel that the sniper has the upper hand or likewise you do not feel that the enemy has the upper hand. No. And how they've managed to balance the game when clearly it is one person versus all in a manner that isn't, say, akin to Letters of Whitechapel, which has a completely different theme, is exemplary, really. I think it's it's yeah. absolutely an incredible experience. It was just a shame I was so crap at it. So, for dessert, we played... This was a weird one for me, because you and I, and Pete, have become particularly enamoured by the games of Prospero Hall. And which... which Big old props to props to prosp, which are a team of people who have done games we've liked, such as Villainous, which was an incredible surprise for you and I. Mm-hmm. Um, Jaws, Jaws, um, which is also horrified. Excellent game, horrified. Um, see a previous episode of the pod where we talk about those. They've had Rear Window, which comes out, which is supposed to be like the Mysterium killer. Um, but what I discovered was they'd done also done a, um, a version of a game that of an IP that I really, really love, which is The Rocketeer, which is a film that came out in 1990. I think it was 1990, yes. 1990 or 1991. And this is what I love. They're just taking these beloved IPs and creating these beautiful homages to them and finding ways to take the you know the narrative of these ips and gaming fire them in a way that feels enjoyable for those who are big fans of the original ip like i'm a massive fan of the rocketeer it was my first real comic book film and mm-hmm. i love the kind of iconography of it it's such a beautiful iconic image of the rocketeer and the helmet in particular and but it's also enjoyable for those who haven't watched the rocketeer or the ip you're not losing out from that really and this is a two-player game, ostensibly a two-player game, where one of you is the goodies, which is, you know, the rocketeer who has the plans for this rocket they've come into possession of. The other is um, the enemy, which is a mixture of gangsters and Nazis trying to find those plans. And it's an asymmetrical two-player game where you're kind of head-to-head and there's this kind of tableau in the middle, this little board in the middle, sorry, which features tableaus at different locations from the film. And you've got this. You've each got three minis, and by playing certain cards, which are beautifully kind of, you know, designed, the art and the cards. It's wonderful. It's not just stills from the film, which they could have done. It's actual kind of wonderful kind of paintings of images from the film. Those the playing of certain cards determines who you move and where you move to them to, and then it becomes a question of trying to be the person who has the majority of control of a particular area or in the case of where there's you know one from either side tussling with that other person to knock them out yeah. gain control of that space and getting the reward from that space 
But the asymmetry comes into play where you as the Rocketeer, Sam, you have the plans already and it's in one mm-hmm. of three cards and you I don't know which one you've given to them to because they're face down and I have to try and get those plans off you because at the end of every round you're getting a perk from having those plans. So I'm trying to get those off you. So it's a little bit of free card Monty there. Whilst at the same time, you and I are having this game where we're trying to um, kind of have area majority, say, in places. But also there's this game where we're trying to actually what causes points to the game is getting these finale cards. And it's whoever has the, the most points from those finale cards wins. And I get every card's got a slightly different amount of points. So I don't fully know what our scores are at by the time the game ends. And yet there's a clock also, which is... Um, a blimp an airship oh, the blimp. that moves across that's my favorite bit of the game i think the blimp. and you don't know how fast it, sometimes it moves one space sometimes it moves two at the beginning of round sometimes it doesn't move mm. at any point and you randomly shuffle right. these so the game could accelerate to the end quite quickly or it could drag a little bit and this was great again i wasn't very good at it uh <laughs> but i really really enjoyed it and yeah uh, to yeah, be honest, I, I, I was hooked by the art. When you open, mm. when you take the lid off, you see the Rocketeer helmet kind of looking at you. It's a beautiful image. And then I didn't realise this, Sam, actually. When you take everything out of the box, there's this beautiful line drawing, kind of almost cartoon, a bit like um, Micro Macro, Crime City, of all the different locations from the film, The Rocketeer. Oh, no, I saw, I, I saw that, yeah. It was, it was incredible. Uh, yeah, so... 45 minutes so it's quite chunky for uh, in terms of duration for a, a two player head to head kind of game but i really really enjoyed it, mm, it, for, it yeah for for me the um i think the the most the mechanic that really drew me into it was the fact that you can only play with each character once on a an, in a round so each character can only do one action and those actions are determined by the cards that you've got in your hand as well so each card has a symbol with it so each card can only be used by a certain um, member of your cast i suppose and trying to maximize your turn knowing that you can only move with one person once was super was just I, i love that i love that kind of because like you've got the rocketeer who's like balls to the wall action like oh he you know he's really super strong he can take he can take people down but and 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 ideally what you want to do is just fly around with the rocketeer knocking everyone out and um you know running away with the plans but you can't you like you you can you can move him or you can just stay where you are and tussle and suddenly you're having to really find ways to work through the game to get the most out of every single turn and it's lit and i felt like at times you know i was you know wringing a cloth like trying to squeeze every single ounce out of every single turn yeah and you really feel it when you you haven't done enough when you've wasted a turn yeah when you haven't been able to do something like you really feel that pressure on you, and I loved it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, that, that, that was a mechanic for me that really made it sing. Can I talk about something adorable and? weirdly macabre because I appreciate we've been speaking a lot about game stuff which isn't a bad thing at all it's one of our one of the, one of the kind of core aspects of who we are and I don't mean as a podcast I'm talking about you and I um, <laughs> but uh, I recently finished watching the first series and I'm really glad it's one of hopefully many to come of Our Flag Means Death, which dropped an iPlayer not long ago, but came out last year on HBO Max, uh, which comes from David Jenkins. And I'd heard, you and I spoke about this, I'd heard reviews that, oh, it's not very funny, this kind of stuff, really. And 
I, I want to preface all of this by saying that actually it's a romantic comedy, but first and foremost is the romance in this. And that for me is what makes it memorable for me. And that's the moment where I really, it, I really took to it. It's not that it isn't funny. It is funny, but sometimes there are jokes that just don't land with me um, in a particular way. I know some okay. people have spoken about, but it is really worth a watch. It's only ten episodes, each one about thirty minutes, and 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 I didn't. I, I'd heard of Steed Bonnet, and this is based. It's a fictional version of the of this real life historical figure, Steed Bonnet, who uh, within the narrative of this sitcom. Uh, absconds from the comfortable I say comfortable financially comfortable family life he has with his wife and two children to become a pirate uh, in okay. well in his at this case with the character being played by the wonderful Reese Darby my namesake mm-hmm. a character in his 40s just decides has this midlife crisis and says I'm going to go off and become a pirate so I'm going to stop being a gentleman in Barbados and and now go and become a gentleman pirate. Um, and he has, I would say, a, a very unconvinced crew who are trying to understand how that all works. And then he encounters um, Edward Teach, a.k.a. Blackbeard, who is just known as Ed um, by Steed. And it's that encounter that changes his life. And the way that plays out is you've already got a kind of an interesting comedic kind of premise there. It's like, how does this gentleman in the late 40s who loves fine dining, literature and immaculate clothing, so he has a walk-in wardrobe on his ship, um, <laughs> how does he fit into the rough and ragged world of piracy? Yeah. Uh, as, as Blackbeard points out at one point, he says, um, you've got a wooden fireplace on a vessel made of wood <laughs> surrounded by books. <laughs> and... What's really interesting over the process of the 10 episodes is that Bonnet discovers that he is ruthless, hmm. but he doesn't give into it completely. Um, because when the, the, it's a slight spoiler, but he ends up very early on killing somebody kind of by mistake. And okay. uh, he's trying to come to terms of it. So he talks to one of his crew who said he, he sailed with Blackbeard and he says, um, so he talks about, you know, Blackbeard killed a lot of people. How did he process it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, he's got a completely different way of captaining his crew and what I love is that whilst he's discovering the ruthlessness of being a pirate um, his crew likewise revealing through him that they have this surprising sensitive side mm. so they actually quite like talking through their problems as a group they get together and sit down and talk through their problems on the ship they like it when he reads them a story at night and it's just a delight, really, in that regard. There is a kind of an overarching narrative there, but it's mm. got that wonderful kind of thing which you can put on. It's it's shot in some beautiful locations. It's made up of a wonderful uh, cast of... kind of quite international cast, actually, very diverse. And there is this romance between Steed Bonnet and Blackbeard, played by Taika Waititi, who is one of the producers of the series. And it is fantastic. And what I just love also is just how beautifully queer the series is, to be honest. Mm. Where there's aforementioned binaries I mentioned, you know, good and evil, male and female, kind of sexualities, that notion of the gruesome and the sweet, they're all kind of beautifully kind of queered in a manner that isn't, well, to, you know, speaking as somebody who is a cis white male, isn't doesn't feel like baiting. It feels very genuine. Mm. And yeah, it, it's a really well, lovely series. I, I think like maybe some of the reaction from it, and hearing you talk about it, it doesn't like when you look at the title and the premise and the people involved. I think that it reads as a completely different thing to what you're telling me. You know, when you think Reese Darby, Taika Waititi, you know, our flag means death. You know, the people who brought you Fly to the Concords and What We Do in the Shadows and, you know, Hunt for the Wilder People and Thor, Love and Thunder and all this kind of stuff. Like, you're expecting that that sort of 
and also the premise of it as well. It's very sitcom esque, isn't it? It's very fish out of water. Yeah, it is all that kind of stuff. I think my expectation was that you know this was going to be you know a full on zany cop- comedy with a capital Z, but from what it sounds like you're pitching it as, it sounds like rather it's a situation where they're allowed to explore certain themes rather than exploit it for comedy. Yeah, I mean, it is quite oddball in places. Um, it, like Looking at it as a romantic comedy, mm. there are some wonderful tropes there, really. And it kind of dawns, in a beautiful way, it, it dawns on both the the lead characters towards the end of the series that they are actually in love with each other. When they look back and actually, if you think about it, it's not just oh, we're doing, we're we're putting these characters in this ridiculous situations for comedic effect. Actually, we're doing it for romantic effect, mm. and that's really, really interesting, really, because as you say, I went into it with that perception that it would be yeah. kind of a a bonkers kind of series, and it is quite bonkers in places, but it's more kind of oddball comedy because it's embracing to a degree the the strange kind of complexities within human beings but actually also just how honest and direct it is in certain instances with the pirates i think it's really quite interesting there's lots of things being confronted here um and you've got that paired with a moment where they're on the beach betting on a fight between a crab and a turtle with a knife tied to its (laughs) shell (laughs) <laughs> and oh. so so there it, it's it's really interesting and it's just a delight really an absolute delight and i i without realizing um i kind of fell in love with these characters and this series and i didn't feel that way when i first started watching it so next time put a peg in it we'll be talking axe throwing recuperating from illness and a board game <laughs> from a company probably uh, designed by Prospero Hall and published by Helvetic who were probably you know in terms of hit ratio the two companies and, and, and people slash group of people that hit it out of the park more than more than most like as as Especially Helvetic, because we played um, we played one of the, a, a new Helvetic game recently called Just Wild. Oh um, yeah, the animal laying game. Yeah, the animal laying game where you're building like a big group of habitat for a specific animal, and um, you do that by adding up numbers that are on the animals that you're trying to cover up. So, say for example, you've got two animals in front of you. There's a five and a five, and there's a ten on your animal that means you can cover up that space it's a super simple concept and it's all done like it, it's it's part of an eco-friendly range like a nature range that Helvetica could doing so that everything's in cardboard everything's wrapped up really really nicely not, it's not there's not an ounce of plastic anywhere on the board but yeah it's just another superb um uh Helvetic small box um game that i absolutely love and Adding to that, like the Rocketeer being another Prospero Hall game, which is delighting and inviting. That I feel like we've already got the in- we've already got the 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 three word intro to next to the next podcast. So, but save us some time. Basically, I thought incredible. Like Pete and Dan aren't here, and we've already started recording yeah. the next episode we've already we've already done the next episode and you could be part of that next episode too if you would like now we know what the subjects are you know helvetic um prospero hall axe throwing and recuperating from illness if you've got any thoughts about those staying in pod at gmail.com or a way to combine all of them yeah uh, that would that would be really impressive but Prospero Hall managed to make an intelligible game out of the film Jaws, so it feels doable. Um, so uh, you could also let us know on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Staying in Pod at all those locations. If you missed anything um, due to being asleep or being busy 
living your life, then go to stayinginpodcast.com where you can see the, um, where you can browse the show notes, where we list everything that we're talking about, and where you can also see past episodes and also information on how to get in touch and how to listen to us if you wanted that but you're already listening to us so it's the best way to experience the podcast i would say it is it is absolutely there's a spotify playlist which chris puts together yeah uh, diligently uh, three of them um which details of which will be found in the show notes there's the steam curated pages and the board game geek um curated pages which detail all the video games and board games that we've ever spoken about so if you feel like it's, it's they're great for gift ideas or you know you've got a bit of time maybe you've got a bit of spare money you're looking for something to play or share with your friends or family or colleague that's almost one of the best places to start is looking at our curated pages on board game geek and on steam Yep, my my mum told me yesterday that her mate Janie turns seventy next week, and she's bought her a copy of Go Town from Helvetique. Well, there we go, smashed it out of the park once more. Well done. Happy birthday, Janie! Yeah, happy birthday. <sighs> All right then. 